Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon uh, in this uh, session entitled Towers 101. This part of the session, we're going to focus on tower safety. Um, we're going to cover a few of the legal requirements which affect towers, the relevant product standards, and how PASMA is helping to make tower use safe. Carrying on from this, there'll be an opportunity to walk outside uh, and look at the tower showcase in the courtyard and see examples of the products we're going to discuss this afternoon. Finally, everyone can come back inside with a hot brew and there'll be a short Q&A session um, with some others up here if you've got any questions that arise from being outside. So firstly, a question. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't, don't want the answer now, but just have to have a think about and bear in mind this for later on. And it's this, are PASMA's recognised standards, BS 1004, BS 11396 and BS 8620, only applicable to towers in the workplace? Just have a think about it and we'll come back to it later. So let's start with some of the legal requirements that affect our industry. I'm only going to look at three, so don't panic, this shouldn't take too long. Um, but the reason to start here is to show that in many cases, PASMA's requirements and guidance are based on legal requirements. It's not just an attempt to become the tower police, as we're often sometimes accused, but our efforts to ensure that everyone works safely with towers and complies with the law. And the first one on the list is the work at height regulations. So the work at height regulations came into effect in 2005 uh, under the Health and Safety at Work Act and was probably the single biggest change to our industry since the Health and Safety at Work Act itself came in in 1974. Its primary purpose is to ensure that employers adequately plan and supervise safe work at height and that it's carried out in a safe manner. An old myth about the work at height regs is that they only apply above a certain height. Well, let's put that one to bed early on. The definition of the regulations of work at height is anywhere a person could fall a distance liable to cause personal injury. The regulations are then extremely clear about what employers must do in relation to work at height. No one must undertake work at height activities unless they are competent to do so, and this also includes the work at height equipment they would be using. Schedule 3 contains requirements for working platforms. And within part two of it, there are detailed requirements for scaffolding. And in the eyes of the law, scaffolds include the scaffold towers that we know and love. Under paragraph seven, it states that any tower scaffold must be calculated unless they've been calculated before, so it's a repeat job, or they've been assembled in accordance with the generally recognised standard configuration. And for our industry, generally recognised standard configurations are contained in the manufacturer's instruction manuals. Depending on the complexity of the scaffold selected, it then goes on to say in paragraph 8 that depending on the complexity of the scaffold, a plan needs to be created by a competent person. A complex scaffold tower, which we'll see examples of later, is not going to be covered in a single instruction manual. The assembly use and dismantling plan can compose of several different elements. The standard plan it mentions here could be one or more instruction manuals accompanied by a method statement and engineering drawings. We'll look back at this subject a little later when we look at prefabricated tower scaffolds in more detail. And then in section 12, it states that scaffolding may be assembled, dismantled, or significantly altered only under the supervision of a competent person. So on top of regulation five, we saw, which states that everyone must be competent to work at height and use the height, work at height equipment. This regulation specifically requires that scaffolding, of which towers are a form, must be assembled, dismantled, or altered only by those who have received specific training in the operations envisaged. There are many different types of scaffolding and different types of configurations of scaffold tower. We'll come back to this point about competence later, but think about it this way. I took my driving license and passed when I was 17. I understand the rules of the road and consider myself a safe driver. But just because I'm competent to drive a car, would it make it com me competent to ride a motorbike? So in summary, what are these requirements saying about scaffold towers? Well, firstly, scaffold towers need to be calculated, unless calculated before, or built to an instruction manual. Secondly, depending on the complexity of the scaffold tower, a safe use assembly and dismantling plan needs to be written by a competent person. And lastly, scaffold towers must be built, altered, and dismantled by individuals who have received appropriate and specific training. Let's move on to the legal requirement number two, and it's the Construction, Design and Management Regulations 2015. These regulations apply to construction work including building, civil engineering or engineering construction work. In Regulation 19, Paragraph 2, it states that any temporary structure must be of such design and installed and maintained so as to withstand any foreseeable loads which may be imposed on it 
and only be used for the purpose for which it was designed and installed and is maintained. This sounds a lot like work at height, doesn't it? Be of such design, withstand foreseeable loads, similar to the need for strength and stability calculations. Like the work at height regulations, it's making a point here that scaffold towers, as a form of temporary works, need to be designed for the job and then to be installed and maintained correctly. However, unfortunately, this isn't always the case. As a recent HSE prosecution, which came to light in February, proved. A facade, taffle, a facade scaffold had been assembled on the gable end of a house as part of renovation works. Eight metres long, seven metres high, nothing particularly unusual. But this facade scaffold fell into a primary school playground just ten minutes after lunch break. Now, I'm sure when the scaffold has assembled it, it wasn't their intention for it to fall into the playground. I'm sure they'd done lots like this before and never had a problem. The subsequent investigation found that this scaffold tower, the scaffold had, been, had not been designed. It was not tied into the building, nor were there any other attempts made to stabilise it. This is an example that legal requirements for safe working practices are not there to create red tape or a burden on business. They are there to help save lives and reduce injury. If the scaffold company had complied with their legal obligations, then this wouldn't have happened. Clearly, this is a tube and fitting scaffold, but there are lessons to be learned here with scaffold towers, as we'll see later. Towers can be assembled in a similar fashion, and they must comply with the law in just the same way. Lighting the mood slightly, we move on to the next set of, or the last set of regulations in this session, the General Product Safety Regulations. These regulations are there to protect consumers under the Consumer Protection Act. GPSR, as it's known, is built on the principle that no producer shall place a product on the market unless it is a safe product. It's quite a simple statement, but it's quite powerful. Anything available for a consumer to purchase has to be safe. The producer, either manufacturer or importer, is responsible for ensuring that what they sell is safe. If it's not safe, it's called dangerous. There's no middle ground or shade of grey with this. But how does a producer come to the conclusion that a product is safe? Different producers may take different approaches to product safety. And here's an example. Two companies sell products in the same market in the same country. One buys its products from overseas and the other from manufactures them themselves. The company buying from overseas believes the supplier to be trustworthy. They spend nothing themselves on product testing as the overseas supplier assures that everything is fine. The company that makes its own product spends tens of thousands of pounds on every year on testing, third party certification and auditing. So who just decides which route is right? Both products could be safe. Well, thankfully in regulation six of GPSR, there is a hierarchy of methods for producers and importers to follow. This states that a product which complies with certain safety standards is presumed to be safe unless there is evidence to the contrary. This is called the presumption of conformity. The hierarchy starts at the top with products complying with rules of law, such as gas appliances or furniture. Below these are then product standards, either European or British ones, and then underneath these are product safety codes of good practice in the industry concerned, such as our own PASMA Operators Code of Practice. Lastly, are state-of-the-art and reasonable consumer expectations regarding safety. I suggest that if you're having to rely on the last two, you're either in a very innovative field of technology or perhaps you've not quite done as much research. The reason I include this in our summary of legal obligations with our industry is that within GPSR, the definition of product includes a product which is intended for consumers or likely under reasonably foreseeable conditions to be used by consumers even if it's not intended for them. So these regulations impose requirements concerning the safety of products intended for consumers or which are likely to be used by consumers. The products covered are defined in Regulation 2 and extend to second-hand products, ones intended for professional use which can be foreseen may be used by consumers, and products supplied in the course of a service. Now, remembering my first question at the start about our standards and whether they apply outside the workplace, and I think we have the answer. Outside the workplace, I can go online now and purchase a tower or a podium delivered to my house from any number of sources. I can equally go into a hire shop and rent the same for use in my home. As a consumer, I have the right to presume that the product is safe, as it is the producers, importers and distributors' responsibility to ensure that only safe products are sold. So in summary, what do these regulations mean for scaffold towers? 
The worker height regulations say that towers must be calculated for strength and stability or built to a standard configuration which can be found in a manufacturer's instruction manual. And towers must be assembled, altered, dismantled under the supervision of a competent person who has been trained in the operations envisaged. The construction design and management regulations say that towers must be designed, installed and maintained to withstand any foreseeable loads and they should only be used for the purpose for which it was designed. General product safety regulations say that only safe products should be placed on the market and that includes <coughs> professional products which it is reasonably foreseeable to be used by consumers. I'm hoping that this brief explanation about the legal requirements is leading us to a similar conclusion, and it's this. That by producing towers that comply to product safety standards, producers are demonstrating their compliance with their legal obligations, and that the products have been designed, calculated, and produced together with adequate instruction manuals. In the workplace, users of tower equipment need to be competent themselves or supervised by a competent person, and they need to be competent in the equipment that they're using. And domestic users have the right to assume that a product is safe, and producers supplying products designed and made to a product standard are a good way of demonstrating product safety. Both the Health and Safety Executive and the Office of Product Safety and Standards continue to promote the use of product standards an effective way of ensuring product safety. So we've now seen an element of the legal requirements which affect uh, scaffold towers and why scaffold towers should be designed to product safety standards. Let's have a look at the standards themselves now. I'm going to start with the standard for podiums, BS 8620. 8620 is the British product standard for low-level work platforms. They have one working platform, side protection to reduce the risk of falls from height, a maximum platform height of 2.5 metres, a maximum safe working load of 150 kilograms, inbuilt access to allow users to climb safely to the platform, and supplied with a detailed instruction manual explaining how to use the product safely. They provide a safe method of working at low levels through the integral design of guardrails compliant with the worker height regulations and inbuilt stability to prevent overturning. BS 8620 replaced PAS 250 in 2016, and the intention was to convert the PAS into a British standard with as few changes as possible. This was largely managed, however, the conversion incorporated changes to the stability and dimensional requirements. Overturning tests were made more stringent, with the overturning load moved from the platform level to the upper guardrail. The dimensions for side protection were changed, making the possible gaps smaller between the side protection elements. This reduced the risks of users falling from the platform through the guardrail. Both of these changes were introduced at the request of the Health and Safety Executive due to ongoing investigations with incidents involving podiums. I think it's worth mentioning here that despite popular belief, standards are not written just by the manufacturers. For any product standard in any country, the drafting and revision process involves input from key stakeholders such as user groups and regulators like the HSE. This may not be to everybody's liking, but the process is there to ensure that balanced safety standards are produced. Our advice for podium users has not changed in that they do not need to stop using Power 50 compliant products immediately, but when these products are replaced, they should be replaced with BSX 8620 type approved products. As well as the dimension of material requirements, BS 8620 is a product standard which is based on validation through physical testing. A podium designed to BS 8620 must withstand different loads and load combinations in order to conform to the standard. And these tests include strength, overturning, rigidity, sliding, access stability, working platform strength, side protection strength, and access strength. Only once all the dimensional, material, and test requirements have been satisfied fully can a podium claim conformity with the standard. If you're specifying you're using podiums which are certified to BS 8620, you have confidence that they have been designed and rigorously tested for demanding work environments. Let's now look at EN 1004. Since 2004, this has been the standard for mobile access and working towers in Europe. But it has a wider reach than just Europe. It's been adopted as the standard for mobile access towers in South Africa and incorporated as SANS 51004. New guidance in Singapore to, on work at high safety will soon recommend towers in accordance with the standard. Hong Kong guidance on scaffolding recommends towers also in accordance with EN 1004. And the UAE are working on adopting the standard just like South Africa did. Mobile towers to be 1004 have a working platform height of between 2.5 metres and 8 metres for outdoor use and 2.5 metres and 12 metres for indoor use. 
are constructed from prefabricated elements such as platform units that fix the dimensions of the tower, which is then movable horizontally on casters. They have platforms with side protection to reduce the risk of falls from height, which is also in accordance with the dimensional requirements of the worker height regulations. Towers have safe access methods to the working platform in the form of vertical ladders, stairways or stair ladders, and they have stability provided in the form of stabilisers, outriggers or ballasts. Mobile towers must also be provided with a detailed instruction manual. The manual must be in accordance with another European standard, EN 1298, and it should explain how to safely assemble and use the tower, the components required for each platform height, safety information including working wind speeds, permissible side loads, and the number of permitted users, to name just a few. I think at this point it's worth mentioning that we continue to receive questions about how to build a tower without a manual. To be clear, without an instruction manual, you don't have a tower. You have a pile of tubing with the potential to be a tower. Comes back to my point earlier about the legal requirements. And by following the instruction manual, you're following the design which the manufacturer has created and received certification for. In addition to the requirements of the standard, PASMA has two recommended methods for the safe assembly of dismantling and mobile towers. These are called advanced guardrails and through the trap, AGR or 3T. 3T method was developed by PASMA and its stakeholders when the worker height regulations came into effect in 2005, and this was due to the need to have guardrails in place before a user stands on a platform. Prior to this, it was not unusual for the person assembling the tower to have to stand on the platform on the top rungs of a tower before adding the next end frames and guardrails. Over the last 10 years, AGR systems have become more popular due to the speed of assembly and the benefits of assembling the, the entire next level from the one below. Following 3T or AGR systems mean that users should never be exposed to the risk of standing on an unprotected platform. As all platform levels are double guardrail before the user stands on them, which reduces the risks and consequences of a fall from height. 3T or AGR are used by all plasma manufacturing members in the products they produce. We saw a little earlier that BS 8620 podium was validated mainly through physical testing. In 1004, however, it's slightly different. There are some physical tests, for example, deflections on the whole tower or the guardrails, but the complete tower is verified as a structure through calculations in accordance with the structural design standard, and these are known as Euro codes. EN 1004 contains the loads and load combinations, which must then be taken through a structural design based on the corresponding material Euro code. The easiest way to imagine this is, and how this works is to think about a steel frame building. It's made up from a number of elements which have connections to join them together much like a tower. The strength of the building is made up from the strength of the elements, the steelwork, and the strength of the connections. Again, just like a tower. Now, when buildings are designed, they don't usually create another version of the building for load testing. Normally, they normally load the building after construction. It's just not possible to apply all the loads from wind, snow, people, office stationery to validate the design. What they do is to create a computer model of the building and then subject that to all the loads a building is likely to see and confirm the building will stay up. And this is how it works with towers. Towers are subject to combined loads from users, tools, materials, winds and side loads, which all occur, could occur at once. Combined loads like this would be difficult, if not impossible, to repeat in a test lab. Through using a computer simulation of a tower, these loads can be applied and the tower verified safely, taking into account safety factors for materials and loads. And this brings me back to the legal points we started with, that by following the manufacturer's instruction manual for an EN 1004 compliant tower, you can be assured that it has been fully designed and calculated as the law requires and safe to use. Finally, on EN 1004, this standard has been under revision for approaching 10 years now, which is quite long for a standard revision. And when we started the project, we all thought it wouldn't take too long. How can tower use across Europe be so different? Well, how wrong we were. Um, we're now hopefully reaching the end of the revision process and the last formal vote, if it's positive, in the next few months, we should see the revision of the standard in the new year. The main changes to the new revision of EN 1004 is that the scope of the standard has been amended and the lower platform height of 2.5 metres has been removed. Towers within EN 1004 in the future start at ground level and go up to 8 metres outdoors and 12 metres indoors. This means the standard will have new requirements for access into towers below two metres. EN 1004 and EN 1298 require users to access the platform from inside the tower. So how do you manage this when the tower is around a metre platform height? 
When the platform is around this height, gaining access to a tower fully equipped with side protection, diagonal braces and tow balls is quite a challenge. With these lower platform heights, the committee responsible for the revision of Air 1004 felt there was a risk that users would be encouraged to climb the outside of the tower. And this could lead to users then climbing the outside of the tower with greater platform heights if they're used to doing it at lower levels. New requirements have therefore been included which allow access to the working platform using the access types already in the standard, but from the outside of the tower. The requirements also allow for openings in side protection such as gates, so users do not have to climb over the guardrails. But this method of access is limited to below two metre working platform height. Above this, the standard continues to require that access to the working level is from within the tower. When the revision is published, there's a number of PASMA courses which will need to be reviewed and updated in order to reflect this change. A bit more work for Chris on the training committee then. Let's now move on to the final standard, BS 1139 Part 6. This is the British standard for scaffold towers which use components from EN 1004 systems but in configurations that are outside the scope of EN 1004. These configurations include towers outside the height limits of EN 1004, so things in the future above 12 metres, linked tower scaffolds, cantilever towers, step towers and towers built on base plates. Towers which conform to this standard must meet the minimum safety requirements as stated in the standard which are then closely based on EN 1004. In 2014, it underwent a significant revision and update. It took into account some of the experiences from the key stakeholders, like the HSE, and PASMA's experience in developing the towers for professional rigorous course. Prefabricated tower scaffolds designed to 1139.6 include no limits on working platform height or size. They can be static and built on base plates or horizontally movable on castles. Using components from EN 1004 mobile towers, they are constructed from elements that fix the dimensions of the design, like platform units and braces. All platforms must be equipped with side protection. Safe access to the working platform is also provided in the form of vertical ladder stairways or stair ladders. And finally, stability is provided in the form of stabilizers, outriggers or ballast, just as an EN 1004 tower, or it can be tied into a suitable rigid structure like a building and made static. Prefabricated tower scaffolds are constructed using the components you'd find in a, in a normal a, a mobile tower, like braces, platform units and end frames. But the standard also has requirements for what's called enabling components. These are components which, when combined with mobile towers, enable other types of structure to be built. And these are things like walk-through frames, step-through frames, cantilever frames, beam units and bridge decks. Following the same approach as in 1004, prefabricated scaffold towers need to be designed and calculated to verify the design meets the requirements of the standard. The enabling components form part of that calculation and analysis, supported by physical testing if required. BS 1139.6 also contains requirements for how the scaffold tower should be marked. Due to the nature of using components from EN 1004 systems, it's likely that prefabricated tower scaffold could have different loading requirements from that marked on some of the components in the tower. For example, a platform unit might be rated at 200 kilograms safe working load, for say, but if it's using a cantilever tower as the cantilever platform, then this load might need to be reduced. It's also possible that due to the complexity of the configuration, this could be designed, um, a prefabricated tower scaffold could be assembled on site for use by others, and they would then need to be aware of the loading capacity as well. It's therefore vital that safety critical information is shown at the bottom of the tower. BS 1139.6 requires prefabricated tower scaffolds to be marked at or near the base with information such as the number of simultaneous working platforms, number of persons permitted on the tower during assembly and use, and the safe working load on the platform. By marking this information predominantly at the base of the tower, safety critical information can be shared with users and supervisors of the tower scaffold. Because BS 1139.6 is quite a wide ranging design standard, it doesn't set limits on what could be designed. So for example, it doesn't say that a cantilever tower needs to be a certain height or a certain size. What it does do is allow the designer or manufacturer to, the freedom to design a solution that's required, whether that's for a specific application or a tower system with a manual. Since the standard was published, there has been some confusion now about how the standard is interpreted and what products or systems can be created. So over the past year or so, PASMA have been working on improving clarity over product, these categories and their requirements. And these have been split into two separate groups, standard configurations and non-standard configurations. As we saw earlier, the work at height regulations require that tower scaffolds are designed before use, 
and this has been designed before, or in accordance with a generally recognized standard configuration. So standard configurations are tower scaffolds which come with an instruction manual, just like a mobile tower, and contain a similar level of detail and safety information. These configurations are not site or task specific and mean that anyone with the right competency can build the scaffold tower anywhere it's required. Standard configurations include step towers, cantilever towers and link towers. These are the ones which we've started with thanks to help from our members and over time may grow as other standard configurations are developed. Each of these configurations has their own risks and hazards beyond what is contained in the Towers for Users course. There continues to be a misconception in the industry that the Towers for Users course allows cardholders to build anything using a mobile tower set of components. Through these standard configuration categories, supported by manufacturing member products, we can start to dispel this myth. And that is also why PASMA is continuing to revise and develop training modules to match the scaffold tower configurations. Let's have a brief look at each of the standard configurations, starting with cantilever towers. These are particularly useful in gaining access over obstacles like refrigeration units or ducting, and they come in two different types, end and side. An end cantilever has the platform extending outwards from the tower end frames, and access is provided with a step-through frame. Side cantilever has the platform extending sideways from the tower, with the platform units running in parallel to the main tower. Towers with cantilevers must be stabilised to prevent overturning. The weight of users, tools and materials on the cantilever section of the tower could cause the tower to overturn, if excessive. So they are stabilised using either stabilisers or a ballast section fitted with weights, or a combination of the two. All ballast weights must be of solid materials such as steel or concrete and must not be made of liquid or granular materials such as water or sand. Materials like these are likely to be reused on site, um, even potentially while the tower is in use. And finally, for assembly and dismantling, the main tower and the stabilisation together with any ballast must be fitted before the cantilever section is added or removed. Don't be tempted to remove the ballast first. Next, let's look at step towers. Step towers provide a safe means of access for working on stairwells. There are very few items of access equipment that can work on stairwells, and how many of us have seen a light fitting or an air conditioning unit in a stairwell and thought, how do they get up there? Step towers have the end frames offset, allowing the tower to be built up the stair flight. One of the challenges with building a tower on stairs is that it could prevent people from using the stairs depending on the size of the tower and the width of the stairs. The risk assessment for using a tower on stairs should consider how people can evacuate the upper floor safely, especially if this stairwell is the only means of access. To make life easier, some manufacturers provide walkthrough or portal frames which are fitted to the base of the tower. These allow access through the tower for those working on it and for evacuation in the event of emergency. Finally, let's have a look at link towers. Linking towers together provides users with a large working area, for example, when working on ceilings or if there is a need to span a large obstacle, such as a boardroom table. Link towers come in two different types, end and side, just like cantilevers. End link towers use standard platform units or longer bridging platforms to link two towers using the end frames. To allow the user access through the top, a step through access frame with gates or removable braces are used. Side link towers use standard platform units fitted to bridging beams which span the gap. On both types, braces are added above the link section to provide full guardrails to the working platform and at all times following the 3T or AGR method. On the other side to standard configurations are non-standard configurations. And these are tower scaffolds which have been designed for a specific application. As these have been designed for a specific job, they would not usually come with an instruction manual, but instead must have a safe use assembly and dismantling plan, as we saw earlier in the worker height regulations. The plan usually consists of a drawing of the configuration with details of any ties, imposed loads, and some safety information, a method statement explaining how the tower should be assembled, used, and dismantled safely, any relevant tower scaffold or mobile tower instruction manuals, which could also be used in reference as part of the assembly. Building a non-standard configuration to a drawing requires a greater level of competency to build the tower scaffold tower safely. This is why PASMA recommend that non-standard configurations are assembled and altered and dismantled by those holding the Towers for Professional Riggers certification. Lastly, on BS 1139 Part 6, I'll talk a little bit about certification. Third-party product certification is widely used in many industries, not just our own, to demonstrate to the market that a product is safe 
and it has been independently assessed by someone other than the manufacturer. All plasma members undertake to supply certified products with BS 8620 or EA 1004, that's relatively straightforward uh, for producers to obtain third party certification. However, when BS 1139 part six was revised in 2014, it was understood that obtaining third party certification for some prefabricated scaffold towers might be difficult, if not impossible. A certification body like BSI or TUV is not going to provide a certification mark for a one-off scaffold tower. So the revision of the standard included a set of requirements for what's called a design certificate. This certificate is created by the designer of the tower, which is usually the manufacturer, and includes much of the same information that a third party certificate would. For non-standard configurations, this allows the designer or manufacturer to provide evidence to a client that the design conforms to 1139 part six without having to release the whole verification report, which may contain some commercially sensitive information. Although not as robust as third party certification, it is a method to demonstrate that someone has designed the tower scaffold and it fully conforms to the requirements of the standard. For standard configurations like towers on stairs, third party certification can be obtained. It's like a tower, but a different shape. Passport requirements for third party certification apply to these configurations as well as BS 8620 and DN 1004. But as we're still at an early stage in the further development of these standard configurations, PASMA Council last year uh, agreed to accept manufacturers' design certificates as proof of conformity as well as third party certification until next year. For those of you who are still awake, you'll be happy to hear I'm reaching the end of this and um, close to wrapping up this part of the session before we go and have a look outside. But in conclusion, I just want to summarise a few key points about working safely with towers. Firstly, the law requires that towers must be designed, and this is not because of adding red tape or for just doing it for the sake of it, but it keeps people safe. As we saw earlier, a scaffold collapse on a primary school could have been avoided if those responsible had adequately undertaken their legal obligations. Following instruction manual or a safe use assembly and dismantling plan, users are working safely with towers. Secondly, that products designed in accordance with standards demonstrate a level of safety recognised in law. PASMA's recognised standards are familiar in the workplace and the HSE continues to reinforce their support and the use of standards. In addition, if a product can be used by a consumer, even if it's not intended for them, then in the hierarchy of requirements, product standards are applicable here as well. Using access equipment in conformity with standards means that users are working safely with towers. And lastly, in the workplace, the law requires that users are competent for the equipment that they are using. PASMA's continuing work on the standard categories of scaffold towers and aligning them with a competency level will help inform industry. It will provide a clearer message that simply owning a PASMA guard does not entitle uh, the user to build anything from tower components. Ensuring that users are competent for the equipment they are using means that they are working safely with towers. So this brings me to the end of um, this session. I think the best way to go and understand some of this stuff is going to look at it in real life in the tower showcase out in the courtyard. Um, you'll see examples of 8620 podiums, in 1004 mobile towers and 11396 scaffold towers. Um, there will be some people outside in high vis and I'm just looking at one of them at the back. Chris? Yeah, just sort of my, uh, my Fair enough. So if you would like to follow that very quiet gentleman from Glasgow there, I'm sure you'll have trouble finding. Um, We'll come back just briefly. We'll spend about half an hour or so out there, and then when we come back in here, we'll have a little Q&A session if anyone's got any questions.